डॉक्टर बाबा साहेब आंबेडकर ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी Hello in this module on film studies we are going to look at one of the most important elements of cinema sound in fact the the element which is only next in important to the visuals that you see on the screen so uh, this is something which has been discussed for a long time how is the sounds of a film sync with the visuals and we forget that once upon a time cinema did not have any sound at all it was the era of silent films so it lasted till 1927 when the first full fledged talkie was made in america but let's look at how uh, sound is synced with visuals how sound came in what are the types of sound that we hear in cinema so it's interesting to note that both devices were invented the device for recording sound and the device for recording visuals uh, were invented nearly at the same time in fact thomas alva edison was involved in both and it was his disciple one of his disciples dickinson who perfected what came to be known as the kinetograph the predecessor of uh, lumiere brothers cinematograph so this happened uh, almost at the same time phonograph in 1879 and dickinson's invention coming just 10 years later w k l dickinson he was directed by thomas alva edison now let's uh, think of a time when the cinema was silent how did they manage how did they manage without sound they had several means of doing that one was the display of intertitles we have subtitles today and in those times they used intertitles so as the action went on uh, suddenly you saw a frame on the screen with titles telling you what is happening for instance in uh, charlie chaplin's film city lights you see this intertitle after a few days or uh, the day dawns again which means the intertitle indicates the passage of time and sometimes the conversation of characters i didn't recognize you the intertitle tells you actually this is the conversation of one of the characters so this was one way of doing it the second way of in introducing sound was by playing music in the theaters where films were exhibited so the music would accompany the visuals on the screen and here you have an another uh, interesting tradition this was uh, practiced in japan it was called benshi so when the film was played it was a silent film of course there would be a narrator sitting in front of the screen fully armed with uh, a musical instrument and narrating the events in the film so in between he would uh, go into a song full fledged narrator okay music and song as well as narration to accompany the film so in the 30s in the early 30s even when talkies had become a reality in america the japanese went for benshi now uh, let's look at the first talkies In America the first talkie was the jazz singer directed by Alan Crossland which was released in 1927 in India the first talkie was Alam Ara 1931 directed by Andhra Sheer Irani Now let's see, see how sound was uh, kind of integrated with uh, visuals at the beginning so the first attempt was made by as i said playing uh, music and then not only music but dialogues were also played recorded separately 
So as the action went on on the screen, you could hear the dialogue of a character which was played on a uh, gramophone, right? So this was called sound on disc, okay, recorded on a phonograph, played on a gramophone and accompanying the visuals on the screen. A little later came sound on film, the first kind of uh, sound on film. This was an analogous kind of recording of sound. Okay. Sound was converted into electronic signals as light impulses. They were recorded as tracks on the film and a photoelectric sensor in the projector would convert these to sound when the film was played. A sensitive sensor which uh, as the projector ran would convert it into sound and it would be played on the speaker. Now, let us look at the advances in sound recording over a period of time. Uh, one major advance, I would say it's a, it was a path breaking advance was the invention of magnetic tapes to record sound, more efficient in the film. So, these magnetic tapes were strapped onto the film on both sides, okay. were more efficient, more efficient than the grooves that were made earlier. And of course, this was followed by multi-channel recording. We, we know about stereophonic sound. You could have even more channels. And uh, it requires a good sound system to play these. These were the first major advances. Those came in the 1950s. And then towards the end of the 60s, nearly in 1970, you had uh, what came to be known as the Dolby system, which consisted of high quality sound the removal of surround sound, that is a big problem. When sound was recorded, uh, earlier they tried to record sound naturally, uh, like the visuals, you know. Uh, the sound would be recorded as the visuals were recorded on the film, right. But there were some problems because surround sound kind of uh, paused uh, a big hurdle to the clarity of the sound that the audience wanted to hear. So, the Dolby system eliminated that altogether and it had differentiated sounds, different kinds of sounds than sounds uh, which could be heard at uh, on speakers which were placed at strategic locations in the theater around you. So, you could hear somebody calling uh, from behind you, the speaker would be placed behind the spectator and then on the sides. It gave you a, a feeling of reality as if you are actually in the middle of the action and then you of course had woofers. So, all these improve the quality of the sounds and then uh, as we know today, digital recording uses uh, a, an audio and a video track, okay, recorded and saved as files on disk, very secure, very perfectly done. Uh, not only that they are said they can be removed also and new tracks inserted, right. Even parts of it can be removed. This was not possible with magnetic tapes. With magnetic tapes you have to cut and paste, right. You have to record again and paste that in between, cut off parts which you did not need. All these were done uh, very mechanically. In digital recording it is possible to remove whatever sound you want whatever piece of sound you want, insert a different uh, uh, clip of sound where uh, there was a pause, a gap and then uh, sync it, right. So, such recorded audios could be played by appropriate audio software and audio systems. We have many, when you, when you look at your uh, lab or your desktop, you find many such uh, software, okay. You can play it on uh, KM, you can have a Windows media player, so on. A number of such softwares are available. Now, uh, there is one initial problem that filmmakers faced. The quality of natural sound was found wanting. As I said, when they tried to record sound, not only that there were disturbances from the surroundings, but the quality of the sound was not as good as people expected when you record it in the open. 
So, what they did was to record it in a studio. Uh, sounds which came to be called uh, Foley sounds. Okay. And the people who did that were called Foley artists. Artificial sounds. Sounds which are produced, synthesized in the laboratory. Okay. So, not only sound effects, but even natural sounds, so called natural sounds, like birds chirping, a cow mooing a dog barking, the horn of a vehicle. All these were recorded in the lab and uh, the waves lapping in the sea, okay, lapping on the shore. All these were recorded and over a period of time, there was a library of sounds available. You know, you have just got to take the file and paste it to whatever uh, audio track that you were preparing, right freely available. Now, I think this is the case and you can uh, produce sounds in, in a very artificial way. Okay. So, if you want to have the sound of waves lapping the shore, many people, what many people do is to take a book and flap it uh, after switching on the fan. Okay. If you do it carefully, you get an almost exact replica of the sound of waves lapping the shore, so on. And uh, they uh, they also produced a synthetic speech in the lab. Okay. Synthetic speech meaning the speech of uh, speech that is already recorded. Its quality is changed. So, I will come to that a little later. We will move on to the type of sounds that are heard in a film, the basic sounds. Dialogue of course, is the first that you can think of. Music, mostly background music, then non-linguistic surround sound. Okay. Uh, as I said, the sound of birds chirping, the sound of a brake applied in a vehicle, screeching of the brake of a vehicle, uh, a dog barking, vehicles moving on the road, uh, uh, the sounds of cooking, what you hear, you hear something sizzling in the oven. All these are non-linguistic surround sound and then special effects, special sounds. Okay. Sound for instance uh, that you hear when a ghost appears or the sound to indicate a mood of a character. All these are special sound effects okay. and you have special effects used particularly in such genres like uh, sci-fi, science fiction films. Let us look at uh, how sounds are divided further. You have diegetic sounds. Diegetic sounds are sounds that have their source in the film narrative. What is actually happening on the screen? Okay. So, uh, conversations, okay. sound of uh, somebody pulling a chair. Whatever you see on the screen, not only on the screen, but even off the screen. Okay. It is part of the action. Right? It is called diegetic sound. Non-diegetic sounds are sounds that come from outside, that are not there in the narrative. Special effects, of course, when a ghost comes in, you hear that kind of frightening sound. It is a non-diegetic sound. It is introduced by the director from outside. Okay. Background music, of course, it is not there in the film. Okay. So, uh, non-diegetic sounds actually represent the play of art in cinema over very similitude over reality. So, reality actually obstructs the kind of uh, sounds that you introduce as non-diegetic sounds, but here they are used for artistic effect. So, that is the whole point of using non-diegetic sounds. Then synthesized speech, I mentioned that. Now, this is made from pre-existing recordings of speech. Okay. So, I am speaking now, my speech can be recorded, it can be turned into something else, right. That is why it is called synthesized speech. You can change the pitch of my speech, you can change the volume, you can change the speed, you can change the accent, you can change the timbre, quality. Okay. I can be made to sound like a child instead of an old man. I can be made to sound even like a woman. Speech synthesizers can do all these. 
Foley artists can do all this. So, it is very common to do this in sci fi or horror films or to represent a non native speaker, speaker's dialogue. Okay. So, I, I am not a Punjabi. So, if I am made to speak Punjabi, how, how will it sound? So, what they will do is they will record an actual Punjabi speech and then twist it in such a manner that it sounds uh, very non Punjabi or non Gujarati or non Malayal. So, this is an interesting artistic device and uh, it can be part of an advanced form of dubbing in cinema, right. So, so when you when you hear uh, people speaking a different language, okay, when you want to show that this person is speaking a different dialect, okay, from a language in another language, you use this very effectively. You have seen such dubbed films, many. Uh, a film called Happy Days from Telugu these days, dubbed into I think at least 10 Indian languages. So, in every one of these languages, you have dubbing done in a particular way. For example, to replace the kind of dialect that originally was there in the Telugu movie, right. There are synchronous sounds, sounds which are running along with the shot, okay, right. So, this is very important. So, when a car uh, suddenly breaks on the road, you must hear the sound of the brake at once, not 5 seconds later or not 5 seconds earlier. This is called synchronous sounds. Asynchronous sounds are not that bad. They can be used for artistic effect, you know. For example, uh, when I am entering this room, you hear uh, a conversation which had happened before, which has some link with my appearance here. So, somebody will be telling me, uh, you must appear at the studio at 11.30 sharp. This sound is heard not when I am at, at home or not when I am at another office where people tell me to do that. You hear this as I enter the studio. So, this is an asynchronous sound or you hear a sound that is to come later. So, as I am going out of the studio, you hear the sound of my entering my home, okay, opening the door or my wife calling out to me. So, this is something that is going to come afterwards, another kind of asynchronous sound, so, a sound which ought to come have, ought to have come later, right. So, uh, this is a very commonly used as an artistic device to link uh, shots or scenes. So, in dubbing, you know, it sometimes happens that sounds become asynchronous by mistake. I think you have seen many such films. So, somebody will be moving the lips but you do not hear anything or you do not see anybody moving their lips yet you hear conversation. So, this is this happens by mistake. You have on screen sounds and off screen sounds. On screen sounds are sounds which uh, the source of which you can see. You are looking at the frame, you see somebody speaking and you hear what is being spoken you see somebody starting a bike and you hear the sound. Whereas, off screen sounds are sounds which come from somewhere else, but you know where it is coming from, okay. You hear something spoken in the next room, it is not seen on the frame, right, but you know where it comes from, right. So, off screen sounds are not asynchronous sounds or non diegetic sounds, they are sounds which you know uh, the source of, right. You, but you do not see the source. Voice over, an interesting form of non diegetic sound, okay. So, in which the speaker, if there is a speaker, addresses the audience directly. So, when an action is going on, the speaker will try to tell you to decipher the action, to interpret the action, okay. So, when you see somebody gifting, uh, let us say, a mobile phone to his or her son, there will be a commentary by this uh, voice saying, okay, just watch what is going to happen. So, this comes from outside, okay, mostly from a know all person, okay. Sometimes it can be a voice without a speaker, something like a heavenly celestial voice, okay, something from God. These are very often used in films, okay. Uh, somebody commenting on the action, like as I said here, on this 
gifting of a mobile phone or of somebody giving a love letter to somebody else okay so uh, the audience is warned for example don't take this for real there is some purpose behind this right so this is very common and in commentaries okay uh, in feature films very often okay uh, the voice actually not uh, in the way which i just uh, uh, narrated but in another way reminding the audience of the real nature of the action right or the in uh, documentaries for instance you hear the gist of a character speech given by somebody as a voice over okay sometimes in films uh, dubbed from another language okay you are just uh, allowed to hear the first part okay you hear it being spoken in another language then the voice over commentator gives you a gist of it okay and by which you will understand what is being spoken you don't need to listen to the whole speech background music of course uh, one of the most important uh, kind of diegetic sound okay to create a mood for example to create a setting okay to describe the mood of the characters to indicate the emotions of the characters so in, in earlier silent films music used to be added later so you have music in charlie chaplin's modern times now the film comes with music an original silent era film now uh, comes with music they haven't tried to add conversation because the film was not designed to do that it will be difficult so with the intertitles and all you can't think of adding conversation now it can, it can be done digitally but it's not doesn't look good but on the other hand music can be okay and the appropriate kind of music can be added and uh, just to remind you there are films which don't use music at all especially some art films a film called kodiyattam in malayalam 1977 i remember no music at all only natural sounds no music accompanies the any of the uh, interesting turns in the plot the characters setbacks for instance no music only natural sounds so it is not a necessary element in cinema although most directors prefer to have music okay now uh, sounds uh, are not just things which uh, perform uh, such auxiliary roles sounds are vital to what we call cinematic images i'll give you examples so when you see a person running at full speed and suddenly stopping uh, this can be kind of uh, augmented by the sound sound of a vehicle's screeching brake it's funny of course but it creates a what is called a cinematic image or when somebody is, is in a great state of excitement you can hear his heart beating an artificial sound can uh, kind of imitate uh, a person's heartbeat or when when you see two people fighting okay rivals fighting you can introduce the sound of a roaring lion so on and sometimes you see inappropriate sounds what are inappropriate sounds sounds which normally do not go with the visuals okay so when somebody dies you don't expect to hear funny music or when somebody uh, attends a very gay festive event you don't uh, expect sad music but this can be used for to indicate certain uh, uh, facts about the uh, character or the plot such as when a gay festive event is going on this person is not involved in it 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 represents a kind of setback such as your uh, lover getting married so this is called an inappropriate sound it has uh, such a function right so i, I think i have given you a, a gist of uh, the ways in which sound is deployed in cinema and you have these references uh, tomlinson holman sound of film and television published by elsevier 2010 maria pramogier and tom wallace film a critical introduction p 
Pearson, 2008. Ed Sikoff, Film Studies and Introduction, Columbia University Press, 2010. So, with this we come to the end of this module on Sound in Cinema. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, ha,